you can f forward for me two, two slides. That's the, the downside of the combination presentation, <laughs> right? So, so uh, yeah, that's us. We, that's we us. have the matching yeah. photo and shirt, so you can recognize us a little <laughs> bit better. Um, we had a meeting about that this, this morning. Uh, but th this is how we do that. This is our approach. Uh, we call it the Agility Ladder Framework. And this is something we and my colleagues, about 30 Agile consultants with over 10 years of experience in transforming organizations, this is what we, we, we came up with. This is the, the, the steps, the ladder you climb as an organization, typical organization, to, to become more responsive. And these are not just steps you have to complete the first one to get the other one. It's like climbing a ladder, right? So you have your hands on a different spot than your, your feet. Um, basically, from our experience, a, a transformation is more like solving a Sudoku puzzle, <laughs> right? You have the numbers one to nine, but how to solve it? Well, you probably have to start somewhere and pick some elements to eventually solve it. And you have the, 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 the very big um, Sudokus as well for the larger organizations, of course. Makes it more complex, and that's why we have a job, of course. And Usually it starts with, well, the CEO saying, well, I want to do a scrum. And that's why it's also at the bottom of the ladder. Um, but it gets more interesting if, if you know, you're, you're thinking about scaling, you have multiple teams, or um, you have some, some you know, uh, challenges with larger applications. And um, if you have th this, this transformation from typically a waterfall to a scrum kind of uh, um, environment. Um, it's, it's a misunderstanding that Scrum is basically, yeah, it's 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 set of agreements on how we collaborate. That's it. But the effect this introduction of the framework has is that you're we're, you're focusing on delivering something valuable every two weeks, and that's some put some pressure on the technical side of it. Um, because, well, we have this team really focused on working that challenges the team. And I think, well, that's something you really recognize, right? Yeah, that's difficult. So this is what you were meaning, going from waterfall to scrum? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, at the end, there's a, a product increment, as you can see, uh, a potentially shippable product. And um, so the, the, the focus a team has is delivering value, and delivering value at least at the end of each sprint, and maybe even f even faster. Um, but if you're in a in an organization where we come in, uh, most of the times it's a organization where there's a software product that's I in there for five years, ten years, maybe even longer, and it's not that designed for delivering it every two weeks. Um, architects didn't think about that. Um, some of them work there longer than I am old. I ask questions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How long did you work here? Since 1979, I think. I wasn't born then. <laughs> so, and that doesn't have to be a problem, of course, but most of the time they didn't really follow up the new development and uh, follow the new things like a Docker or a Chef and Puppet and all that sort of tooling. So what do you get? Things like this. Uh, 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 some trains that don't really want to deploy, or if they are deployed, they will uh, generate a lot of errors and faults and problems. Or the application that's in production can't handle the load and will collapse. And uh, this is a bridge, but lots of software also uh, tend to have lots of users, and if they have a lot of users, and the architecture isn't built for it, uh, it, the application will not be able to handle the load. So it's also a problem. And, um, well, there's also something, uh, the, who knows the guy in the middle? You probably all know, right? Yeah. Well, he's forgotten sometimes, huh? And uh, that also happens with uh, architect or architecture. Um, and uh, when, so when we, when we are in that, uh, climbing that ladder, uh, that agility ladder, 
and we are transforming an organization in working uh, a more agile way. So instead of delivering their product uh, every quarter or maybe one or two times a year, uh, we want to deliver that of more often. And we help them uh, uh, establish that process um, and the principles behind them because they're more important. But what they miss quite often is that uh, their technical product, their big application that they are building on uh, several years, uh, isn't changed. So their mindset is changed and they're, they're working uh, on a different level and on a different way and they're using a backlog and all that sort of stuff. But they keep on adding stuff to their already big product. So if you talk about technical depth, there's a lot of it there. Or the application just isn't scalable and then ready for the next step. Yeah. May, may, uh, to, to fill in, uh, I'm not going to mention the company's name because I'm currently helping them to get better. But after 10 years of the company being in existence, they mm -hmm. build up a technical depth of 85 man years. According it's to the scanning tools, right? Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> of course, uh, according to the tools. But that's, that's huge. And the, the funny thing is they, they have this, it's, it's a web uh, company, e-commerce company, and they have this, um, and that's all I'm going to say about it, by the way. <laughs> um, the, they have this search, search functionality, and they built, it's not working that well. So, well, we're going to build a, a, a new one. Yeah, but well, we found out it only works for like three users simultaneously. For a site that has like 6,000 users at any moment in time on their site. That has some challenges. That's where yeah. the situation we run into quite often. And so your application has to be aware of that and, and should handle that. And if, there's a, if, if that has to be an enterprise architect or an architect or a team member or a team that has to figure that out, it doesn't really matter. And uh, in Scrum, most of the times, the development team is the architect. They are responsible for the quality of their product. And they're also responsible of, well, doing it right the first time. And, well, you can say this is done right according to the architecture and nothing wrong with it but yeah it's kind of useless so some waste of money and time of course and um, that also uh, accounts for uh, building software you want to do it right and you want to deliver value um, and maybe you build some technical debt and that's not that big of a problem unless you uh, do it uh, uh, how do you say it in English? Bewust. Consciously. Conscious. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good audience. <laughs> so if you, if you do that, uh, you know that you're building it in and you can handle it. And um, when the time comes and you have to change it, you know where it is, you know how to change it, and you make sure it doesn't get that big. And like Eltru says, it doesn't always have to be a problem. And it can be a, a good choice because it also costs money to do a very optimal hallelujah Rolls Royce glitter spoiler solution. And that's not always the case and necessary. So, but if you look at the architecture uh, part, um, what is the biggest problem when you're going to de deploy something? Well, uh, some company uh, made a nice analysis on that. And um, most problem is the inconsistency throughout the application. Um, and so there, there's, there's uh, uh, lots of relationship with other components. Um, they're all different kind of tools. Um, all that sort of stuff makes it hard to deploy s your software. And uh, well, new trends like uh, microservices, like uh, tools like Docker, um, so you can isolate your application in sort of a container and uh, deploy it to a, a server, whatever you like, and make it scalable. That really helps you in deploying your software often and fast. And, um, and that's just the beginning. Because software is not the only thing. The software has to run on something, an infrastructure. And um, 
what we also quite often see is that the infrastructure on the development server uh, is working fine. And you all know the it works on my machine sentence, probably. Um, yeah, so if uh, some tester finds a bug and the developers say, well, I cannot reproduce it, it works on my machine. And that quite often comes because the development machine isn't the same as the test environment. And the test environment isn't the same as the acceptance environment. And also that is not the same as the production environment. And if they're all different, then you, you aren't able to constantly be uh, sure that your quality of your product is secure. And that's a problem. So also things like uh, infrastructure as code is a really important part of the development process now. Um, so you configure your environment in code, store it in your uh, source control system, and use it to build up your environment and use, for instance, uh, things like Docker or whatever tooling or scripts to deploy your software to that environment. This way, all the time, your environment is the same every step of the way. And it really helps in uh, predictability, quality, assurance, and confidence in that, okay, when I go to production, it's just a push of a button, and it doesn't have to be a scary weekend with five developers uh, with pizzas and Chinese hoping to deliver the product on time without failing. And you can deliver in a few seconds of minutes instead of hours of downtime and that sort of stuff. But what, what do you do when you have such a big monolithical application? Well, you basically have two options. You start over, building the new product, or try to, who knows the program, overhauling, and try to rebuild your old car into something new, flashy, shiny, new engine, and that will take you on for a new couple of years. And so it's really important to to make that decision. And if you are working on a, on a program and you don't, maybe you don't have the money or you don't have the capabilities to restart, then it's, most of the time it's good to at least figure out what's, what's the real problem, what, where does it hurt the most. Uh, lots of things can be automated. And you don't have to use Docker right away or you don't have to use infra as a infrastructure as code right away. Uh, but if you uh, make sure you have the value stream in front of you and you know, okay, what steps do we have to take to build it, to deploy it, um, what handover moments do we have? If you have that insight, uh, you can say, okay, well, there's the biggest risk or there's the most manual work. Let's try to automate that part. So, so, so what, what, do you, what, what do you see architects in transformation we do? What, what kind of um, implementation scenarios you see? Yeah, well, this is one. Yeah. Yeah, so architect as a team member, as I just said, and maybe not as one team member, but it could be the whole team. Thinking and considering the architecture. Helping to make sure that the things they produce is something they are proud of, is stable, and will last for years. And also that's something you have to take into account. Is it a product that is needed to last for years? Because some apps, well, they may live for two years and there's something new on the market and hopefully you are the one that's bringing the new stuff because you're else out of business again. The, the benefit of this is you have the, within a development team, you have the the possibility to take such decisions. And with making that decision as a development team, you get the ownership as well, because if you as a team make an incorrect decision, you're the one bleeding, right? You're the one who gets called up in the middle of the night to resolve well, a bad decision you made. So it, 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 it results in ownership of a development team. And, well, this is eventually what we like teams to move towards, but that's not always the case. So what we, we see, and I'll, I'll give an example of, of, of another implementation scenario we see. That's an architect as a mentor, and that's, that's uh, something I saw at a large financial institution. Um, 
I, I, I helped through a transition. And there was this huge program. There, there, with 25 Scrum teams, they're trying to integrate about 15 off-the-shelf software uh, components. And that was a huge, huge uh, operation. Uh, not only to coordinate that, but also from an architecture perspective. So they tried, the first tried it in the waterfall approach, and after one and a half years, well, they had this very nice sketch, but nothing there. And there were 25 teams who were like, when can we start? Right? Um, licenses were already uh, being paid and stuff like that. So that was a really expensive time to wait. So eventually, when starting, when we had this nice, nice, uh, nice design, um, every team or every team with a component had their own um, uh, architect assigned for that component. And this architect participated in refinement sessions, and discussed with the team why certain decisions from an architecture perspective were made. So the, the teams were educated to, with the why behind it. And in that discussion, uh, new questions uh, may arise, and th th those, those, those architects for each component gathered twice a week to discuss the things they learned while working together with the teams. And the architects also, um, well, not act actively, actively participated, but they joined a daily scrum at least twice a week. So they knew what the team was, was working on, what they were struggling with. It was a really nice scenario we, we saw. Um, another scenario or the, uh, an implementation thing we see in organizations, and the best thing I can refer to that is is, oh, you all know Spotify, right? And I, I, I heard that the, the, the enterprise architect for Spotify, well, he has the best job. I think I can even do his job. And, well, you might or might not know, um, not really technical. Um, <laughs> this person does two things. He just walks around the, the office. And the only thing he does is asks questions. Ask questions to teams. Why do you do that? Why would you think that's, uh, what's the downside of it? Only those kind of questions, constantly doing that. And he said, well, I, I only made one decision in my life. And that was about coding standards or something. There was this lively debate about it. And, well, you probably recognize that or not, but he, he said, well, um, uh, it, it's go, going on and on forever, so let me take at least one decision. He said, well, why don't we use the, the Google standard? It's well maintained, so why not? I'm like, yeah, yeah, why don't do that? He said, well, that's the only, oh no, I asked the question again. He didn't make any decision. He just asked the question. And the second thing he has, he's just walking around, he has this one piece of paper in his hand. And on that are all the teams and the date. And this date, he asks the team when, based on the, well, um, growth prognosis of the number of users, when is your component going to break down? <laughs> At which date? Making the team conscious of, well, how scalable is my, my solution, is our solution. So what happened there, um, he just had to walk around and they saw him enter the room and two or three months before the deadline they gave, he's going to ask like, what's the status in that? So yeah, well, we're, we're already working on it, it's on our backlog. Well, that's, from our perspective, that's a very nice role for an architect to play. Right? Just asking the question, you have to ask the right question, so you have to have some knowledge. But then you're teaching, you're learn, teaching the things, the decisions, the way you do it to the team. It's a very nice approach in transforming organizations. Eventually, or hopefully, ending up that the development team themselves can play the role as architect. Yeah, in fact, you're back to the first version. Yeah. Architect in the team. So these are some of the examples we see in organizations that go through a transformation. And well, hopefully this sparks some questions at your side, which we are now ready for. So let's hear it. <laughs> Do you have anyway. it? Not all at once. Yes, one. Yeah. One, two, yeah. First one was over there. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a bit of a strange question. Um, 
could you summarize in a few sentences what you just uh, told us? I didn't quite get to the core of what you were saying. So in, in, in essence is, <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good question, maybe. Yeah, I was trying to avoid saying that, well, those architects, we don't need them anymore. <laughs> but basically what we're trying to set up is to transfer the knowledge towards the teams. So the teams will be able to make the decisions on their own, the architectural decisions on their own. Yes, we would like to be there, but what we see in transformation, that's one step too far. So we're changing the role of how the architects behave. That's basically what we do. Okay. And maybe an additional side note is that uh, when you're doing a transformation towards a more agile, uh, agile work approach, don't forget your architecture. Don't forget to also change your technical approach because only changing your team and your mindset doesn't eventually uh, help you in producing software faster to your production environment if you still have your technical boundaries and limitations. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Uh, when you're new in an organization, where do you start? Do you start at the management level, the development level? Uh, do you have some blueprint with you, but, but this is how you should work? Or? Uh, as an ar from an architect perspective, or just uh, the organization in as a whole? In a transformation. In a transformation. Um, Nowadays, usually it starts with, or makes the transition a lot easier when you have management support. If you want to change your organization, you need to have a, a manager, preferably a CEO, who says, yes, this is the way to go. And when we do that, we'll, pro we'll challenge them, okay, well, why do you do it? And do you understand what that means to you? So if a situation happens, will you fire some orders, do some con command and control behavior, like you're probably used to, or are you willing to let the team make mistakes, let the people make mistakes, and facilitate them in you know, using their professionalism? That's where we start. And like I said in the latter, usually it starts with just basic scrum. Let's first get together and start working together and focusing on delivering software every two weeks. And then we gradually start climbing the ladder. That's the short summary. On a, the, the slide deck, you saw agilityladder.nl. You can, well, we're sharing our complete approach. So if you want it in detail, you can find it there. There's time for another question. Oh. The talk. Um, based on your examples, where you were giving examples about, well, bridge failing because of too much load and not enough ar architecture, how would you? Uh, begin to describe the problems that arose during the launch of healthcare.gov in the US. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's the Obama thing, right? Yeah. That's the thing yeah. that was completely architectured for very, very, well, not that many users. <laughs> it happened to be the case, but... Yeah, yeah well, if you, if you have the... Uh, probably there were multiple teams working on that under high load and lots of stress, um, so what, they, what you see in that situation is they might be doing uh, iterative deployment or iterative uh, um, um, construction work. Uh, so they're building it and they're adding features and new uh, functionality to it and they're testing it in a, probably in a small environment. Um, but they probably forgot to also uh, do a performance and load test. And not just once when they're almost finished, mm. but doing it every week or every day at least. Yeah. Uh, so they can also uh, validate, uh, are we improving or are we deteriorating and what is our, uh, what can we handle? Could very well be that there was a product owner at work who had this business value only focus, right? And the way we teach product owners is it's value you prioritize on, yeah. right? So those things are, are important, you should consider so. That's something that's high technical risk, so pull that, uh, uh, take that into account as soon as possible. And also listen to your team, because your team is also a stakeholder. Your team is responsible for the quality of the product. They are the mechanics that are able to look under the hood and know what's happening there. And most product owners don't. So if they don't listen, they pay the price. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're out of time. So there was one more question, but we have a small break now, so you can always ask them uh, in the break. So one more uh, applause for these guys. Thank you.